Hi guys, welcome to this revision summary video for everything that you need to know on fuels such as hydrocarbons, homologous series and fractional distillation. The first thing we're going to have a look at then is crude oil. So what you need to do is tell me what crude oil is and how it's made. So nice and simply, a definition, crude oil is a mixture of hydrocarbons and it's made up from dead animals and plants over millions of years. So if we have a look at what a hydrocarbon is, nice and simply, as you can see from my diagram here, it is something made up of hydrogen and carbon only. That word only is really important. For example, if I have a look at this molecule here, which is carbon attached to three hydrogens and a chlorine, it's got hydrogen, it's got carbon. Does it just have hydrogen and carbon? No, it's got chlorine. So it's not a hydrocarbon. So a hydrocarbon is something made out of hydrogen and carbon only. So we've said crude oil is made from dead animals and plants. They're built up in layers over millions of years and the pressure turns it into our crude oil. It's a very similar method for making natural gas. And those are both examples of non-renewable fuels. Some of the major examples, methane, that's from natural gas, petrol, kerosene, and diesel, they're from crude oil. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those when we talk about fractional distillation now. So the next section is about fractional distillation. So what you need to know is what is fractional distillation? How does it work? And what do we get out of it? Nice and simply then, fractional distillation is separating the fractions of crude oil using boiling point. When we say fractions, we mean the different fuels, and by boiling points, we're talking about a physical property. So if we have a look at a fractionating column, the first thing we need to do is take our crude oil and vaporize it. Heat it up to about 400 degrees C so everything turns into a gas. We're gonna add it into our fractionating column, and our column is hotter at the bottom and cooler at the top. So what will happen is when our gas goes in there, straight away our bitumen will condense and turn back into a liquid so it can be collected. Everything else will stay as a gas. So the rest of the gases will rise and they'll go up until they fall below their boiling point. When they fall below their boiling point, they will condense and they will turn back into a liquid and can be collected off. And it goes in the order of fuel oil, diesel, kerosene, petrol, and then our gas is remaining at the top. And from that you can work out that your gases have the lowest boiling point because they're gases at room temperature. What you will be asked to do is work out the properties or describe the difference in properties between different fractions in our fractionating column. So if we talk about the top of the column, we've already said it has the lowest boiling point. It's also the easiest to ignite, it has the shortest chain length, so that is the size of the molecule, the amount of carbon atoms in there. And it's also the least viscous, which means it's the runniest. So if they asked you to compare petrol to diesel, and you know petrol's up near the top, you would say that has the lowest boiling point out of the two. It's the easiest to ignite out of the two. It has the shortest chain length out of the two, and it's the runniest, the least viscous. The last thing you need to know on fractional distillation is the uses. So nice and simply, gases are used in domestic heating and cooking. Petrol is used as a fuel for cars. Make sure you say the word fuel. It's not just used for cars, it's a fuel for cars. Kerosene is a fuel for aircraft. Diesel is a fuel for cars and trains. Fuel oil is a fuel for large ships and power stations. And bitumen is used for surfacing roads and roofs. This next section is gonna have a look at what the term homologous series is. And there are four things you need to know about what a homologous series is. The key thing being they have the same general formula. They also differ by a CH2 molecule as you go up. There's a gradual variation in physical properties and they have similar chemical properties. If we use alkanes as an example then, alkanes have the general formula CnH2n plus two. So what that means that if you have one carbon, so N is one, you have two times one plus two hydrogens. So that means I have the formula CH4. If I have two carbons, so N is two, I have two times two plus two hydrogens, C2H6. And this applies for everything. So if I had three carbons, it would be C3H8 and so on, as you can see from my formulas down here. 
Now the second property I talked about, they differ by CH2. So as I go from methane to ethane, all I'm doing is adding a CH2, which I've circled here. And the same from ethane to propane. So every time carbon goes up by one, I get an extra CH2 molecule. The part where it says a gradual variation in physical properties, if we look at boiling points, for example, as the chain length increases, so does the boiling point. So there is a gradual variation. And then finally, similar chemical properties, the alkanes all react with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. So they react the same way. The next section of this video is going to have a look at catalytic cracking, which is nice and simply breaking down of long chained hydrocarbons into shorter chained hydrocarbons. Why do we need to do that though? So let's have a look at my decane here, which has got the formula C10H22. Now we have a large amount, a large supply of our large chained alkanes, our large chained hydrocarbons, but we don't have as much demand for them. So we don't need them as much. But the smaller ones like C2H4, ethene, we have more demand than supply. We don't have enough of them. So what we have to do is catalytic cracking. So we heat our decane, we put pressure on it, and we use a catalyst, the heat being 650 degrees, catalyst being aluminum oxide, and it breaks those long-chained alkanes, long-chained hydrocarbons, down into shorter-chained ones. And in particular, you get a shorter-chained alkane and a shorter-chained alkene. And by doing that, we meet our demand for the shorter-chained hydrocarbons. Right, the next section of this video is going to focus on complete and incomplete combustion. Nice and simply, the difference between complete and incomplete combustion is complete combustion has lots of oxygen, incomplete combustion doesn't get enough. So if you have complete combustion, your fuel reacts with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water vapour. If you have incomplete combustion, Similar thing happens, it reacts with oxygen, but because there's not enough oxygen, you get different things. You get carbon monoxide, CO. You get carbon or soot, which is C. You can still get carbon dioxide, and you always get water, H2O. Now, you'll usually be told this in an exam question, but they might turn around to you and say, what is produced by incomplete combustion? So carbon monoxide and soot are the key things. Now, you will be expected to write balanced equations for complete and incomplete combustion. So we're going to have a look at a complete one, which is asking for the complete combustion of ethane, C2H6. So it's giving you ethane in the actual question. So we know that C2H6, I can put that in. And it's reacting with oxygen because it's complete combustion. And the second you see complete combustion, you put plus O2. Also, complete combustion tells you you have CO2 and H2O. That's the same for any complete combustion reaction. Then all you need to do is balance it. So you work out what you've got on either side. I've got two carbons, six hydrogens, and two oxygens on the left. One carbon, two hydrogens, and two plus one, which is three oxygens on the right. So what you need to do is choose something to balance. Now, I'm going to go with hydrogen because that's one of the easier things to look at at the moment. And I'm going to times it by three. So that's going to give me my six hydrogens, which makes it balanced. However, that also times my oxygen by three. So you can see this one here, that's times by three, giving me five oxygens on the right-hand side. The next thing I'm gonna look at is carbon. I've got two on the left and one on the right. So I'll put a two in front of my CO2. That gives me two carbons, so that's great. But again, it also doubles my oxygen. So I change that to a four, giving me seven in total. Now I've run into a bit of a problem. I need how many oxygens to get seven? 3.5. Now you can't put 3.5 in because it's not a whole number. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to double everything because that will put that up to 7. I had 2 CO2 so I'm going to make that 4 and I had 3 H2O so I'm going to make that 6. And then I only had 1 C2H6 so I'm going to double that as well so I'm going to put a 2 in front of that. So it will end up looking like 2 C2H6 plus 7O2 goes to 4 CO2 plus 6 H2O. Now it's always a good idea to check this afterwards. So let's have a look. I have two C2s, so that gives me four carbons on the left. Two H6s, so that's 12 hydrogens, and seven O2s, that's 14 oxygens. On the right, 
4 times 1 is 4 carbons. I'll look at my hydrogens next. 6 times 2 is 12. And then let's move on to oxygen. In my CO2, I have 2 oxygens. I'm times in that by 4, so that becomes 8. And then my H2O, I have 6 times 1, which is 6. I add my 8 and my 6 together, and I get 14, which means I'm balanced. We now need to talk about the dangers of incomplete combustion. And there are two major ones, which are the products that are different to complete combustion, soot and carbon monoxide. If we start off with soot, that's the easy one. It blackens buildings so they don't look as nice, and it also can cause cancer, it's carcinogenic. The main thing you're gonna be asked on though is carbon monoxide. And the key thing is that carbon monoxide is colorless, so you can't see it. It's odorless, so you can't smell it, and it's toxic, which means it's poisonous. And what you need to know is why. So if we have a look at some red blood cells, we breathe in normally, but if we breathe in carbon monoxide, by mistake, carbon monoxide attaches itself to the red blood cells, and in particular, it binds with the hemoglobin. The hemoglobin is a red pigment found in blood. So it gets stuck in there. Now eventually, it'll get to the point where oxygen can't get in, or certainly there'll be less oxygen in the blood. If the oxygen can't get to the cells, respiration can't occur. And respiration is how we get our energy. So our cells are going to have less energy, and if they have less energy, that can lead to headaches, tiredness, and eventually it can lead to death. And that brings this revision summary video to an end. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please click on like down below. You can also subscribe to my channel, you can check out the latest video, and you can visit my website up above here. Bye now.